I'd like to call to order this workshop on December 7th, 2020. First on the agenda, we have Dan Goyette. He's going to be giving us our ice and snow plan. A couple days late. That's okay. We'll take it. We'll, uh, we'll see how your plan worked on first contact. Yeah. So, Dan, it's all you. So, I'm here tonight to give you... I know most of you have seen this, just an update and a, a refresher for you and the public on our snow and ice control plan as it stands for this upcoming winter. Um, briefly, our storm procedures, pre-storm meetings we typically have when it's a forecasted event. We invite PD, fire, and the school, if school is in session. We sit down, go over parking bans, schedule any special considerations that are needed any concerns that people have so that we're all set when the storm actually does start um, supervisory staff we are have staff at public works 24 hours a day now until usually beginning of march um, we run a second and a third shift we typically will call in 14 salt trucks those are all our salt trucks when the storm begins to treat the roads. They create a brine on the road as the storm begins so that we don't have snow sticking, which is when you have that hard pack, that's when you have problems. Um, when we get about an inch, the remaining eight salt trucks, are, uh, sand trucks are called in and we go out plowing. So this is our, our operation schedule. First shift, about 34 employees. That includes mechanics and supervisors. 27 second, 26 on third. And you'll see before there was only 22 plow trucks, but we also have four sidewalk tractors, two loader operators that need to load the trucks and mechanics in the garage as the trucks break down or there are issues to service those, as well as the supervisors that are out patrolling and handling any issues that are called into public works, either by the public or by the comp center. This is what our plow schedule looks like, our assignment sheet. I know it's hard to read, just to give you an idea of how the first, second, third shift, driver for that shift, you'll notice there are some blanks down at the bottom. As part of the staff reductions last year, one of these sidewalk tractors is vacant until someone's plow run is done. That is not a school route or the downtown route that we vacated. This is a I'll call it a um, extended sidewalk routes that we maintain in the winter. They're not on the school route and they're not in the downtown, but we still maintain those for the general public. Um, you'll see we have backup vehicles. Those are the two graders. And typically we have one plow truck that's on its last leg that's our backup truck. And this year you'll see that we have two listed and that's because we lost we had to remove a plow route as part of the staff reductions. We didn't have enough people to man it. So that truck is actually now considered a spare. So we have two spares this year. The plow route was combined. Um, it was the Manly Road route was a separate route. That was a uh, truck 16. Truck 16 is taken over a different route and that route was separated between four other routes. So four other trucks now pick up that truck's roads as part of their route. So their runs actually got a lot of, uh, a longer. We typically run about 13 miles per route. So each truck maintains about 13 miles. It depends. Some are eight, some are 16, but it's an average of about 13 miles. <coughs> we actually uh, maintain about 206 miles of road that we plow that center line. Um, to give you an example, Lewiston only has 156 miles. Um, so. As I've mentioned in a lot of previous presentations, Auburn is very big and spread out. Um, so for your priority one roads, those are your center streets might have, those are plowed about every two hours. We try to hit them at least once. Priority twos are three to four hours, threes, four to six, and fours, six to eight. Fours are typically your smaller residential roads and you'll notice 
This is truck 15 and 25. 15, they're sister trucks, meaning they work in tandem to do Center Street, Minot Ave, our four lane roads, they run side by side so that the wind row is pushed off to the side as they go by. Um, you'll notice there, there are ones on this route, there are threes on this route, and there are fours on this route. So what that means is every time they go by, they don't necessarily do Pierce Street. They might only do it the third or fourth time that they go by. This is the map. You, kinda, you can see it goes from Lake Auburn all the way down Washington Street. And I actually have Rosemary was able with the with the GPS that's in every truck, we were able to <clears throat> actually animate. This is a storm, this is actual data from a storm last February 6th of last year. You can see the truck. What you don't see is that there's actually two trucks, but this is the data from one. And this is his route. He goes out to East Auburn, turns around at the boat launch, heads back in town, And you can see that it's a long way. And depending on lights, depending on traffic, depending on the condition of the road, that's it, it, if it's two inches or if it's six inches of snow on the ground, how long it takes. It takes a ride on Minot Ave. It goes out to the town line, which actually doesn't go to the town line. It, DOT maintains a portion of Minot Ave. It's past Garfield is a I'm not exactly sure how they, I want to say it's right past the tractor place. They, there's a spot where they turn around, state takes over. Heads out Washington Street. You can see some of the roads they're skipping, and those are the roads that they don't hit every time they go by. So this is actually real real time data. We can actually watch the vehicles from the truck, from uh, Public Works. So he was able to do the entire run. Did that in 10 minutes. In an hour and 16 minutes. So that's good. <laughs> So truck 12, which is one of our um, smaller trucks that does a lot of residential streets, you can see all twos, threes, and fours. This is out in North Auburn area. I'm not sure, Mayor Levesque, if this is the truck you rode with last year. Sure seemed big to me. <laughs> so um, this is Beaver Road, Maple Hill, North, North Auburn. And we actually have the animation for this one as well, just to give you an idea. The difference, these are both about the same length and mileage, minus the little side streets that they skip and stuff. But because of the road, you can see this one has lots of dead ends, turning around, coming back. And this is one truck doing both both in and out lanes. We're an hour in and he's not halfway done. Holbrook, Hersey Hill, all those minor connectors, I like to call them. So, two and a half hours.
This is a typical seven yard plow truck that we use. It has a side discharge spinner. It's in front of the tires, so it's actually spreading material before the tires, so the, the drive tires are actually pushing on material that spread. It has a plow and wing on the front. It's a rear discharge. We only have, I think, two of these currently. One of our newer trucks, we um, actually ordered a different setup similar to this for a rear discharge. Our one tons, we have two one ton, well actually three one tons that go out and plow parking lots, the winter relief parking, our fire stations, help out on a lot of the smaller camp roads out by Lake Auburn, uh, Taylor Pond that a lot of our bigger trucks can't get down. And then our sidewalk tractors. We man two sidewalk tractors, well three sidewalk tractors, for first and second shifts, third shift, there are two sidewalk tractors. There's a vacancy, hopefully that's filled very shortly. So we'll have three sidewalk tractors out during the storm so that we can get our school routes open as quickly as possible. We have um, three of the, the top sidewalk tractor and one of the bottom, the pre of the tract. And that's it. Um, I can go over a little bit of information. Last year, we we bought about 5,400 tons of salt. Lewiston was 8,100 tons of salt. So we actually are very um, efficient in our use of salt. We have everything is calibrated and monitored when trucks pull in back into our yard. There's a system that downloads how much salt they actually spread, and we can actually track how much salt is spread by each truck so we can determine based on temperature if they're overspreading not putting enough out it's all there's a chart the state dot as well as well, dot's throughout the country based on temperature how much salt you should be spreading etc to, to maximize its efficiency we also use brine which we make ourselves we have our own brine making system and um, we do not use calcium chloride anymore our, we've never had a problem with our brine actually freezing. So un unfortunately, if it gets 20 below zero, it, it may freeze and we will be calling Lewiston to borrow some calcium, but that hasn't happened quite yet. Any questions? Customer questions? I, I just had a couple of quick ones. Yep. Uh, in the animation you had, are you able to granularly see what the trucks are doing or just their location? Like, can you tell if the plow is down or if they're distributing salt, We et cetera, cannot, um, we haven't spent the money for that option. The only thing we can tell is speed and location. Okay, and the other question is, who creates the routes that we currently have? Um, we've created those in-house. Okay, so are those the most efficient routes or is that something that- We, we always fine tune them. Um, Every year at the, at the end of the season, we have a meeting with all the supervisors and plow drivers who have concerns are, are encouraged to bring those forward and say, what would make this easier? What would make this more efficient? Um, a lot of times if a plow driver is able to finish his route quicker than someone else, they're on the radio, how can I help, et cetera. And based on that information, we'll adjust plow route. So maybe he'll have that road next year since he always finishes faster. We'll add that to his list because his route is quicker. But a lot of that has to do with plow driver. And new plow drivers obviously go a lot slower than guys who've been doing it for 30 years. So the what was a quick route may now become a long route if it's a new plow driver. So there's a, a learning curve. So it's always in a, it's a constantly changing list of roads that each driver takes care of. Well, that's good to hear that we're continually upgrading and updating. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah. Thank you. Um, how is your staffing? I think it was last year. I can't remember the last couple of years that it, it was difficult because you yes, were short-staffed. Yes, we are down one mechanic and one driver right now. The driver just had his physical, and he actually has a CDL license already. So he's looking to start in the next week or two, um, which is great. And we actually just had a pot... Uh, promising candidate apply for the mechanics position, so we'll be fully staffed, which is great. The upgrade, if you remember, as part of our budget last year was to implement the pay plan, and that has helped 
a great deal in actually retaining and gaining staff. Any other questions? Uh, one question. Could you just briefly tell us what your, um, your workload is like, your collaboration with CMP during a mass outage incident, such as what we just had this weekend? Yes. Um, so the way it works is, for example, this past weekend, which was you know, a great storm, the comm center handles calls. They dis we call the comm center. They call us. If there's a wire involved, that's dispatched to CMP. Um, our job as part of Public Works will go, we'll cone it off, we'll barricade it off, but we, are not, we do not touch trees that have wires intertwined with them. Um, Charlie, the city's electrician, Charlie DeAngelis, he may go out, certify that we're allowed to touch it, move it, but we don't do, Public Works does not do that on our own. Um, CMP will coordinate with us, hey, the wire's dead, feel free to move the tree. They're in constant contact with our supervisors during the storm to alert us of when they've removed the wire, we were allowed, you guys can go get that tree now, the wire's gone or that wire's dead and it's certified. We have a guy there, you can go move the tree while they're working and that sort of thing. So you expedite the issue and but work under guidance from CMP? Yes. Got it, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, we help them as much as they, we can and they help us as well. Dan, oh, Dan thank you very much. No other question? Oh, I'm sorry, was there? Do you have a question? Oh. Okay, no, I think we're good. Okay. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you. And uh, tell, tell the folks good job, too, this weekend. So, no, much appreciated. Great first storm. <laughs> it's going to happen every year, right? Yeah. The first storm. And it's never the last. Sabrina Best, you're up next. Recreation. Good evening. Um, here to talk about Auburn Trails, and before we dive into this presentation, I want to make a, a full disclosure. This is by no means a complete list of everything. Uh, this is more of just a quick snapshot of information I was able to gather um, in time for tonight. Uh, there is tons of more information out there, but this is what I was able to put together. Uh, so, uh, when going through and trying to put together just a, a basic list of trails in Auburn, uh, came across a ton of different community interest groups and organizations that already have um, been putting forth a, a good amount of effort uh, when it comes to Auburn trails, um, regardless of mapping the different activities, uh, maintaining land, uh, and so forth. Um, uh, again, this is not by any means a complete list. There are definitely more partners out there, but these were the ones that I was able to, to quickly grasp. Um, definitely hitting some of those community organizations, the Andrew Scroggin Land Trust. Um, we made sure we put in some of the snowmobile clubs, uh, those with uh, the Auburn Ski Association and Nordic Ski um, Conservation Commission, um, as they have a uh, in the past held a subcommittee that was focused on trails. Uh, the Parks and Rec Advisory Board as they had developed the Friends of Mount Appetite work group that then focuses on the trails in that area. The Lake Auburn Community Center and the Lake Auburn Watershed Protection Commission are huge, definitely out in that Lake Auburn area um, with the amount of activities and trails that they've been able to put together. And then there's a few other kind of scattered throughout there. When trying to put together a quick list of the different trail systems, um, it was very quick to identify those that were publicly owned and privately owned. And I think the, uh, the biggest takeaway from this is that we have a really good mix of public versus private, which is ideal for a city of our size because there's no way that the city can maintain and organize all the different trail systems within a city. Um, and vice versa, I think having all, all of that um, uh, responsibility placed on private or ownerships uh, and relations, it, it 
you know, it puts a strain on that and there's not always that good cohesive connectiveness. So I think putting this, again, this is not a complete list, but uh, hits the high points of the main uh, locations that we have throughout the city. Specifically when it comes to trail mapping, um, what I found when I was going through is that there's no one centralized hub when it comes to Auburn trails. Uh, everything is organized and promoted individually. And some of them promote their maps uh, online. Others, uh, like the, some, some of the snowmobile clubs, you have to be a member to obtain that map uh, and have access to where those trail systems are. Uh, currently, the staff is working, uh, city staff is working on updating our park finder map. Uh, and this will include trails. Uh, these are just a few snippets of what that app will look like. Um, we recently have connected with uh, Bates College to begin the conversation of using their students to help go out and map these trails. Again, some of these trail systems already are in a GIS type of a system that we can easily upload into our system uh, with Rosemary. Others are not. Uh, others are just a paper map, which we can put up there, but it's not as accurate as sometimes we would like. Uh, so being able to get individuals out there and actually walk the trail systems and collect that uh, data is really big to making sure that we have a cohesive uh, and up-to-date information, specifically when it comes to any kind of an emergency situation. Someone calls having uh, emergency personnel have access to a centralized hub and be able to identify where that, will, that person is, how the safest route to get there is. Uh, those are all very critical. Some other, uh, other uh, trail maps that are used is Trail Forks, um, Main Trail Finder, All Trails, and Trail Link. Um, each have a, a different variety of which trail systems they have on, on their app. They're, none of these have all of the ones specifically in Auburn that I could find. One great thing that I found is we have a really great uh, diverse variety of activities that can happen on trails, uh, which is not something you always find in every community. We have a good mix of winter activities and uh, that, that access is huge in Lost Valley and the snowmobile clubs kind of being you know, a big hub of, of most of those types of trails. Uh, we were able to find a few kid-friendly and ADA accessible. Uh, I think that is probably one of the areas that the city lacks in general uh, with having a good solid inventory of. Um, but we do have uh, a few out there, so there are opportunities for them. When doing a, a good dive, there's quite a few uh, different plans and studies within Auburn that Auburn has done that are specific to trails or mention trails in them. Obviously, the strategic plan has talked a lot about it. Uh, the new Auburn master plan <coughs> touches upon uh, trail systems as well, uh, the comprehensive plan. Uh, Lake Auburn had uh, their uh, bike and pedestrian master plan done um, that will hopefully come back into uh, the cycle of things uh, in the future. We have the joint use study, which was really specific to trails at Mount Appetite. Um, and then there is an Auburn Trails Feasibility Study. This seemed to be tailored a little more towards trails um, along the Little Androscoggin River um, and the Main Central Railroad. And then just really what's the, what's the future for Auburn Trails? Do we have a vision? What's our master plan? Uh, mapping is obviously a critical point. Connectivity, how do we connect trails throughout uh, all of Auburn? Uh, and to get to point A to point B, uh, development and upgrades to trails. This is really where this open discussion is, f is here for you guys to kind of provide that kind of direction and input. And that's all I got. Yes, Sabrina, thank you very much. Uh, open this up. I think Sabrina just opened up the door for some uh, conversation. Councilor Ball, start off. Thank you for your presentation. It's nice to see a conversation about trails, especially given how much they were utilized over the spring, summer, and fall this year. Um, and I hopefully I envision that going forward as well, that increased use. I think that when we're talking about a vision for our trail system, I think connectivity has to be at the forefront. 
I think that that is a real driver for tourists and for people to actually utilize trails when they can get you from A to B more easily. And I think that, um, you mean you have a better background in this than I do, but connected <coughs> trail systems are a great economic driver for communities. And if you have more to share on what those benefits are, economic benefits are for communities, it'd be great to have that context as well, because I know that it is a really important element. Thank you, this is really great. Um, we, we have so many resources here. At some point, is the plan to be where somebody can say, I wanna look at a snowmobile trail that is ADA accessible, or I wanna look at a kid-friendly trail that is by water or something. Will you be creating something that is that um, sort of layered? Yes, um, when we uh, update the park finder map and we add in those trails, uh, we will be able to identify the different uses of each of those trail systems. So then you can go in and put a filter in of kid friendly or snowshoe only. Um, those kinds of filters in and then you can kind of get an idea of, all right, these are the lists, this is the map of where it is, I can click on it, gives me the address and maybe some more of those amenities, indoor facilities, dogs allowed, um, and so on. So yeah. Great. I have a quick question in regards to um, the publicly owned parks, specifically Mount Appetite. Are we, is there any uh, plans in the future to limit the activity that's out there? And I'm specifically speaking about mining that's still going on out there because uh, the mining that's taking place is taking away a lot from the beauty of the area. You've got a lot of people out there that are digging out the roots of the trees. They're digging around the bases of boulders. Uh, I'm just wondering if there's any plans at all to address that. Uh, so the Friends of Mount Appetite uh, work group have uh, you know, talked about this, this exact uh, example, specifically digging out underneath the tree roots. And we've reached out to a few of the mining groups that are within the state of Maine to try and help gather a list of actual rules and then help be able to educate those that do come uh, in both the parking lots and then once you get into the area, identifying this is the safe area to dig obviously outside of this is not allowed and then these are your basic rules to follow while you're doing it so it is something that's been talked about obviously with some more signage and, and education that we can put out there hopefully we'll get it addressed at some point yeah, just a great point as a reminder you know Mount Appetite is of significant state historical significance if we go to the Maine State Museum there's certain geological displays that are featured from Mount Appetite um, it was used for mining well before it was used for anything else um, uh, a couple of things. Every, does everybody realize, any, any snowmobilers here? Um, <laughs> or a father of a snowmobiler? So the snowmobile trails are kept private, um, specifically in order to drive uh, snowmobile club revenues into their individual snowmobile clubs so they can purchase equipment. In addition, they're subsidized by the excise tax coming from these vehicles, snowmobiles specifically, that utilize their trails. Uh, there might be talk about connectivity, there might be some issues with connectivity between those groups making their trails public because they're the ones that have to sign off on responsibility with the private landowners that they bisect and pass through. Um, so there is gonna be some interesting kind of give and take along with the snowmobile organizations and some safety considerations I think as well that need to be taken into effect. Yeah, snowmobiles don't really mix well with certain other types of winter recreation. The Auburn Snowmobile, I can't remember the name of the club, one of the best supported actually in the state, I think. There's four of them actually in Auburn. So there's four, they all have geographical uh, fencing, if you would, and responsibilities. Um, they're, they're good. They, I know the one up in Ward 1 uh, is extremely proactive and their membership, their membership supported. Um, and I know I'm a member. So, but they are, they do very well. And I, I can't remember, Jill, does 100% of the excise tax for snowmobilers go towards, or it's a portion of that, correct? Uh, and state grants? $3,000 every year. I'm There's sorry? There's only three clubs that actually get money from the city. Um, three. They get $1,000 each, every, each year. From the city, from the, their portion of the excise tax? Okay, great. Um, so yeah, that's gonna be an interesting city funded from a certain thing, but again, it's encouraging. Uh, ADA compliance. The only, there's only two, I believe, ADA compliant trail systems in the entire state. One of them is at the YMCA's Stetson Road uh, urban parkland. 
I think the other one might be Waterville, either way. But Auburn is one of two. So that's something that I think we need to be highlighting, and I think the YM would love that as well. So uh, website, hosting, marketing along with this, to piggyback up what Councilor Boss said. Where are the trails and everything? Have we thought that far? Where are they going to reside? Where the mapping is going to be? How do we access? You mean the, the app with, the, with all the trail systems on it? Uh, so Rosemary is working on that so it would be housed internally here within the city. Um, there would be a further discussion on if we would only push out and promote the public, uh, publicly owned uh, lands and how to navigate the private ones. <coughs> Uh, another option is to partner with any of those organizations that are already established. Uh, LA Trails is a great example um, where they already have collected a good portion of this information, um, but just trying to identify, um, you know, do they house all of this information? Are they just a co-sponsor? Um, can they help with funding for certain grants that the city is unable to obtain at this time? Um, so those are definitely some of those options out there is, you know, how do we move forward from here and what does that structure look like? Um, I would not have at this time, at least any major recommendations, but I think a good conversation of getting everyone to the table and just start that, um, you know, buzz going, I think would be a great idea. Do you need anything asked or excuse me, do you need any answers from the council at this point in order for you to keep moving forward with your work? Um, I, th I think we can just continue to move forward, start uh, those conversations, kind of see where that has guided and then just provide some updates um, just so the council is aware and then help kind of give some more definitive answers on which is the best approach when it comes to these things. Great, thank you very much. If there's nothing further, we'll move on. That's it. Thank you very much, Sabrina. You're welcome. See you on the trails. <laughs> trail, trail ahoy. Um, Next, Mr. Cousins, trap road zoning and some amendments to that zoning, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, been working with a property owner on trap road since, um, I think it was around 2016, 2015, um, and they had permitted a large uh, marijuana grow structure. Um, we've reviewed the plans with them since their more recent inquiry and they clearly planned on additional phases when they constructed that back a few years ago. Um, they've sized the wastewater disposal as well as the uh, electrical service. Uh, here's, here's an image um, of that area. Um, re most recently, they applied for a permit to build a, this, this building is existing, it was built a couple of years ago. Uh, before we had adopted our marijuana ordinances. Um, Eric, since, can you just zoom in on that page a bit? Yeah. So people can see. Very top there, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Better. Um, the property owner lives in this house. Um, they've most recently created a new property line to separate the commercial grow facility um, from the rest of the parcel. Um, if you're looking at the zoning in this area, this area that's uh, a darker shaded brown, uh, both sides of Trap Road, um, is the rural residential zone. Um, until we adopted the marijuana ordinances that we adopted in 2019, um, all of the agricultural uses, with the exception of a few, um, that were allowed in the agricultural zone were also allowed in the rural residential and low density country residential zones. Um, that didn't extend into the smaller lot residential zones necessarily, but the larger rural lot residential zones had the ability to basically do anything you could do in the agricultural zone plus housing. Uh, when we adopted those in 2019, after this owner had already built a substantial uh, building around seven or 8,000 square feet um, and sized the utilities for further expansions, um, they applied for a building permit. We told them that we couldn't issue the building permit because of the zoning that's in place. And that's uh, upset them. You know, their plans were in place before we had the ordinance and they were upset that something changed um, that they didn't have control over. Uh, and we talked to Councillor Walker uh, because they're in his ward uh, about whether or not he'd be willing to meet them out there. We met out there, spoke with the property owner, um, had a follow-up meeting with Councillor Carrier and the property owner on site and one of the ideas was 
um, if we do want to promote the uses that are allowed in the agricultural zone, especially in this very rural part of Auburn, um, just a couple hundred feet, few hundred feet short of the end of the residential zoning strip um, where somebody could either build all the buildings they want out back here or beyond the end of the residential strip for marijuana cultivation. Wanted to at least talk to the rest of you as a group, um, see if a relatively minor in the scheme of zoning citywide and even in this neighborhood uh, change would be something that you'd want to at least send to the planning board, get their opinion, and decide if it's something you wanted to pursue. Um, it would allow the creation of, um, you know, one of these buildings is pretty close to a half a million dollars in value. Um, they may um, have two or three more of these in the long term if they can. Um, they at least want one in the short term and uh, wanted to see what the council thought about possibly taking out that uh, red crosshatch area, taking that out of the residential zone, expanding the agricultural zone in that area, and through a public hearing process, making sure that the neighbors are not, not opposed to it. That's all I had. I'd welcome any questions. Councilor Zani. Um, are the neighbors aware of this potential? The, the neighbors are aware of the existing grow facility. Mm -hmm. um, city staff has not talked to them, but I understand that the property owner has, uh, but we could confirm that. Uh, we haven't specifically talked to them. And uh, Councillor Carrier, Councillor Walker, have you, do you know how the neighbors feel about this at all? Uh, talking to the owner of this property and some of the others, there is uh, no problem at this point. There's one gentleman that that's not sure if he likes the idea or not, but uh, at, at this point, most have no problem with it. And when he built the very first one, not one of them neighbors objected that he, you know, do that. And like uh, Eric said, he also owns his own house, garage, business as well on that other lot. So he's been very, <clears throat> he's been very. Uh, willing to work with the neighbors in regards to it uh, when council Walker and I were out there they were in a processing phase uh, and standing directly outside the building there were no orders and uh, he's been very attuned to what the neighbors have had to say I know what the neighbor across the way uh, and he's always made sure that you know the the neighbors are exactly aware of what's going on out there and, and just something else too, after having walked the land out there, there's really not a true agricultural use. That whole upper end of that, which is just, I'm gonna say north because it's up, it's west actually, I think, of that, that whole area up in there is ledge. It's all ledge. Uh, so you're not going to plant anything up there, but, to, excuse me, to the area, to the, uh, my left of that building, he had done site work already uh, to that to have it ready for another building to be put in uh, when <clears throat> when we changed the rules back in 2019 so he had to stop uh, so he is very in tune with what the city is doing and trying to stay exactly within our guidelines and I think with with this change this minor change I think it would be beneficial to the area and he has still during the time from construction till now has purchased land from a budding property owners they're aware they've worked with him and they he's been cooperative with his neighbors Councilor Moss. thank you with the addition of another building or multiple buildings after this first one are there any other changes that need to be made to the site since it's a commercial grow facility like lighting or anything else that would be disruptive that the neighbors might not be thinking that far down the road about he he does have to have at least motion sensing security lighting on the buildings. Um, I think what he has out there, and I could double check, is more like the wall mounted wall pack lighting mm -hmm. uh, motion sensor that shines downward on the ground for security lighting. Uh, we haven't had any complaints. We could certainly, as we do public notices, talk to the neighbors about that. Uh, but he would have to have some lighting on the exterior of the building that at least turns on if if somebody was moving around the building for security. Plus there's no other structures back there either. Yeah. Uh, that was one of the reasons. Behind. He owns it all, all the way back. One of the reasons we wanted it on that. And my last question is just, are there any other 
um, commercial grow facilities like this one that had the intention to expand, but now the ordinance has changed and they may also be coming for a zoning. So we, we could look at who's licensed to see who's in a residential strip like this. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if there's another one. Um, I'm not aware of one specifically, but we could check that fairly easily off of our licensing data. There may be one on the steel road maybe one there. Yeah. steel road i think is already all agricultural and he built he built in the agricultural zone the only one that i'm aware of there most of them built in the agricultural zone but we could we could certainly check i wouldn't be surprised if there is one okay. you know i don't think it's widespread it, two things that might make this a little bit easier first of all um just want to check is there consensus here of the council to move forward to bring this ordinance post workshop quick question i just just <coughs> you probably mentioned this what's the total number of acreages acreage in that um crosshatch zone I could get that for you. Let's see, 150 deep probably by 600. So um, probably in the neighborhood of five to seven acres. Okay, I could get you the exact yeah. number. That's helpful. You know, there's two things that might be helpful. A, um, have any counselors here actually taken a tour of an indoor commercial growth facility before? You know, I have. So it might be helpful if not this one, I can help or Eric can help set up a couple of tours of a couple others. So you can actually see the internal and external safety, security, what the smell is, what it looks like and so forth. Um, we can do that if you'd like. I think that'd be beneficial on this one too. And especially on this one, even walking some of that land, I think it's important to look at what the charter, excuse me, the comp plan says is the best economic use for that land. Um, the ledge aspect is something that doesn't support crop or actually support grazing animals well either. So it might be something to look at as we come through the comp plan discussions on what the best use is for some of our land in our city. So I don't, it's kind of hard in the winter, um, but if you know, I'm up for it, if the counselors are up for it too. So it might be a good uh, exercise. Is there anything else? I think Eric has his uh, marching orders. It's good? okay with you. We'll see what the planning board thinks and come back to you for an answer. Absolutely, and go through the process. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you. Yeah, that's the last uh, workshop, public workshop we do, we have tonight. We do have, and we have time, we have two executive sessions. The first one is an executive session for economic development pursuant to one MRSA section 405. Do I have a motion? It's moved. Second. second. I have a motion for Councilor Carrier, second for Councilor McLeod. All those in favor? We now stand in executive session.
Okay. We're on the air. Mm-hmm. I'll now call to order this meeting of December 7th, 2020. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you all could stay standing, please. I just, uh, while we're up here and it's a fitting time, just like to take a moment of remembrance. It is the... 79th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. And I think there's a, a lot of us growing up in that generation afterwards, realize the importance and the hardship of that day and what that signified for the next five years of American history. So please join me on that. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, could I ask that we stand for Norm McEwen, which was Councillor of New Auburn, Ward 5, for a few years? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Walker, for that, too. It's a reminder. We don't have any consent items for tonight, but you have the minutes of the November 9th, 2020 special city council meeting. Are there any corrections? If not, I'll actually have a motion at this time. Okay. So, accept. Second. Motion for Councillor Walker, second for Councillor Carrier. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Minutes are approved by vote of 7-0. Uh, we also have the minutes of the November 16th regular council meeting. Are there any corrections? If not, I'm going to entertain a motion to approve the minutes of the November 16th, 2020 meeting at this time. Second. Councillor Milks, second by Councillor Walker. All those in favor? Minutes are accepted by vote of 7 0. Now, on the communications, presentations, and recognitions. Uh, we don't have any presentations and recognitions. We push those off. Um, communications. Anybody in the council have any communications? Councillor uh, Lasagna. Nine people of the. Um the uh, farmer's market from 11 to 2 on Sundays. It's really a great place to go um, and get your fresh um, produce and meat and all kinds of things. Councilor McLeod. I just wanted to remind everybody that LATC has a survey out. So even if you don't ride public transportation, they'd still like to hear from you. So it's a five minute survey. You can go to purplebus.com. I took it actually, it's quite user friendly. So whoever put it together, give them our thanks. Um, if you haven't noticed, you will tonight because it gets dark around 3.30 when you're all here. Our Christmas tree in Festival Plaza is lit. Great job by Public Works, uh, Sabrina, Communication, everybody who decorated it, got it up, Cody Crane, uh, for volunteering yet again their time and service, and the great family, um, and I'm, the names eluding me, over off Sunderland, actually, in your neighborhood, that donated a beautiful tree in their front yard uh, for our festival, or excuse me, our holiday season. So uh, that was a great evening. We're going to move on from communications, oh, excuse me, to the city manager. Mr. Manager, do you have anything tonight? No, thank you. Okay. Open this up to the first open session of the night. Members of the public are invited to speak to the council about any issue directly related to city business, which is not on tonight's agenda. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak? Someone check. Jay, could you just check through the door in the community room and see if there's anybody there? No. no. Very good. Thank you, Jay. I'll now close this open session. Moving on to unfinished business, there are, is none. But next, we have new business. And we have ordinance 11-1202020, adopting a zoning map change to expand the T4.2 traditional downtown neighborhood to the developed downtown enterprise district. This is a first reading. I'll entertain a motion. Accept. Second. I got a motion, Councilor Walker, second from Councilor McLeod. I'm going to open up the public hearing. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak? If so, please step up to the podium in the community room and speak. You saw no one back there, Jay? Okay, very good. If you just 
if we could just check one more time, I want to make absolute sure. We have no one waiting to speak. Yeah, you're sitting, you're the new guy, you're sitting in the hot seat. We're gonna make you do that quite a bit. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'm gonna bring this back down to the council. Council, is there any conversation or debate on this? We've uh, workshopped this quite a bit over the last few years. Questions? None being. I'm gonna ask for a roll call vote at this time. Councillor Milks? Yes. Councillor Carrier? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Boss? Yes. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Lasagna? Yes. Councillor McLeod? Yes. Order passes by vote of 7 0. Next, we have order 12 120220, adopting a zoning map change to expand the T 4.1 traditional Main Street neighborhood. This is the first reading. I'll let you take a motion. Tap. Second. Motion Councillor Walker, second from Councillor McLeod. I'm going to open the substances of the public hearing. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak? If so, please step up to the podium in the community room. Seeing none, I'll bring this back to the council. Council, is there any debate on this conversation? I just wanted to clarify the ordinance is 12120720. Yep. Every seven, you said a two. Again, you remind me of myself and me of my all. grandfather. Uh, <laughs> thanks for that correction. Hold on, let me just. Okay, very good. Um, is there any debate, any conversation on this topic? None? Sue, can I need a roll call vote, please? Yep. Councillor Milks? Yes. Councillor Carrier? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Boss? Yes. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Lasagna? Yes. Councillor McLeod? Yes. Order passes by vote of 7 0. Next, we have order number 128-12072020, approving the proposed rate adjustments to the, pol to the policy on emergency medical services, billings, and collections. I'll entertain a motion at this time. Second. Motion Councilor Boss, second for Councilor McLeod. I'll open this up to the public for comment. Is there anyone in the public that would like to speak? I have Chief, Chief Chase, I see you standing by. <laughs> And uh, we'll ask, if we have any questions, we'll, we'll sure to uh, ask you. Thank you for being here tonight. Uh, council. Could, could you explain that a little bit? Yeah. Okay, Chief, I'll turn it over to Chief Chase. You want to give us a quick um, or a good thorough overview of this policy change? Uh, sure. The primary driver for the policy change is our medical reimbursement services, our medical billing company uh, that handles our EMS billing. Did a review of our current charges and did a comparison of our charges to some other regional EMS providers. They noted that we hadn't made a change in our um, EMS billing rates since we started EMS Transport in 2014. Uh, after their analysis of some of the regional, other regional providers of service, uh, they recommended these incremental rate adjustments. Um, the rates as you see them defined, uh, ALS, ALS, to those rates are actually um, defined by CMS, uh, which is basically Medicare. Um, so that's how they break down our ability to bill um, into those pay categories. And we're, we are just making uh, the adjustments. Um, what this will do for us, uh, Medicare and Medicaid, um, have set reimbursement rates. This really doesn't affect that, but what we do bill private insurance companies gets adjusted by these new rates um, to keep us, uh, again, incremented and competitive um, in our reimbursement rates for EMS services. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there any further questions of Chief Chase since we have him at the podium? None? I believe $36,000 an estimated annual increase. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. Um, any debate? Any conversation? None being, I'm going to ask the clerk for a roll call vote again, please. Okay. Councillor Milks? Yes. Councillor Carrier? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Boss? Yes. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Lasagna? Yes. Councillor McLeod? Yes. Order passes by vote of 7 0. Thank you. Next, we have order 129 12072020. 
authorizing funds in the amount of $25,000 from the FY20 CIP for fitness equipment to be reallocated to Mount Appetite uh, upgrades. Um, I'll entertain a motion at this time. So moved. Second. Mr. Councilor Boss, second for Councilor McLeod. Open this up to the public. Is there anybody in the public that would like to speak? None being at this time, I'm going to bring this back to the Council. Council, this is obviously uh, talking about in a pickup from our workshop item this morning. Mr. Mayor, if I could, I would, before Please. Council speaks, I would just say I'm really pleased that Director uh, Sabrina Best brought this forward, obviously with uh, changes that took place during, uh, because of COVID, this project was not going to really be beneficial in this fiscal year. She recognized that, made this recommendation, brought it forward, uh, talked with the finance director, um, bringing this back before you as the appropriate process for reallocating funds that you have already voted on, and that's what the CIP request would do. Um, and then Sabrina also outlined for you what those upgrades would go to um, as part of Mount Appetite. Can you just quickly for the public tell us what the upgrades are? Sure. So the proposal would be that $8,500 would be improving the parking, which is located on the small road entrance. This is uh, specific for snowmobile trailers that use that access to gain access to those trails. Partnering with Central Maine um, NIMBA for a uh, in-kind service of $1,500, $6,500 would go towards the gravel. Um, about 12,500 is the uh, total need. So using 6,000 from the comp plan CIP to help with that um, assistance. And then $2,000 towards equipment rentals. Um, they're currently seeking some donations from local businesses to be part of that. And then they, their names would be part of the signage of that project and would move forward with that um, as part of a sponsor. And then 16,500 for improved signage. This is the master trail map at the two main entrances add trail signage with possible arrows and distances to either entrance from along major trails and the design and install an emergency numbering system signage throughout the park that correlates to updated trail maps and then improve the signage at two main entrances and update the trail map on a printout that is provided at both entrances of the key rock kiosk i can tell you over the years we've had several people that have gotten turned around that's uh, very easy to do i've spent many many hours up there looking for people. Um, it's easy to get turned around. To have this proper mapping and improved signage and emergency uh, numbering along that trail is gonna be really important, a great upgrade. I agree, uh, particularly with the signage. And in terms of equipment, outdoor equipment, snowshoes, skis, what, what equipment are they talking about? You're talking about the initial CIP allocation? No, and the breakdown of the agenda packet. Packet. That's equipment rentals for uh, the project, to oh. do the project. Okay. So renting some of that equipment to do that project to try to get some sponsors to help with that, or $2,000 would go towards that. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Mr. Manager, I, I agree that we need to do some of this stuff up there, but I'd like to see a little bit more of what kind of detail and where you would place some of these signs and how they would look, because... I'll tell you the reason why I want to see what it looks like. Some of these crazy signs that we allowed people to put downtown here, 50 feet away, you can't read what they say, and we wasted a lot of money on allowing that to happen. So I would like to see a little bit more of her plan on $16,500. That's a lot of money for signage. So this is, um, yeah, that's a great question. And so we would be meeting the standards that go along with proper trail mapping signage. Um, if you go up there currently, you'll see some of that's already been done on some of the trails. And those are the trails when we talk about partnering with Central Maine um, NIMBA for what they've done up there. And that's part of uh, what they've done regarding some of those trail markings. Uh, these would meet that standard marking requirement for trails. Uh, but I can certainly have Sabrina provide you uh, more detail of that project and, and the layout and we could probably do a good presentation. Uh, that would be helpful for the public as well to know just some of that um, trail markings and emergency contact and, and uh, good proper entrance. Being able to leverage that small road entrance and really try to encourage the public to go and use that entrance will be really helpful as well. Any other comment? None being. Sue, can I get a roll call vote, please? 
Councillor Milks? Yes. Councillor Carrier? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Boss? Yes. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Lasagna? Yes. Councillor McLeod? Yes. Order passes by a vote of seven to zero in the affirmative. Thank you for bringing that forward. I will. Next, I'm going to open this up to the last open session of the night. Members of the public are invited to speak to the council about any issue of city business, as long as it does not. Point of order. Oh, geez, goodness. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm fogging up here. Let me try it the old-fashioned way. Next, we have order 130-1207-2020, approving an order preventing the unauthorized use of the city name, brand, likeness, and character. I want to hear a motion at this time. So moved. Second. I got a motion from Councillor Gary, and uh, excuse me, I got a motion from Councillor Gary and a second from Councillor McLeod. I'll open this up to the public for comment. Any members of the public that would like to speak? Jane has both got out of here real quick. I'm going to no, say, uh, Councilor Walker, we have the, uh, oh, have the camera no. up. If there, Councilor Walker, we're fine. But you'll go up there. It's good for him. <laughs> we always have to ask, but thank you. Um, I'm going to bring this back to the council for any debate or explanation. Um, I asked Councilor Carrier and Councilor Gary if they'd support this in council. I'll let them speak if they have anything to speak about. But the sample, or the order rather, is in the packet as well. Anybody? Councilor Lozani? I just have a question about the last sentence of the order. Any outside group soliciting funds from local, state, or federal sources must seek permission from the city council before using it, before using city council approved names, logos, logos, or monikers in their solicitation efforts that imply municipal support. Any outside group? Do we need to define that? It, I mean, could it be? I just want a little well, clarification on that. Yeah, you know, it's a good, it's a, it's a good thing. Obviously, the enforcement we have is limited on anything, right? On this line, but I think the key phrases are imply municipal support. If they're using our slogan or logo or seal to imply municipal support, that is problematic. There is a state statute, and I could, I'll just read it because. It's section uh, MRS title 30-A, section 2006, misuse of municipal seal. A person may not use or display an imitation, likeness, reprint, imprint, representation, facsimile, or copy of a seal of a municipality except by written permission of the municipality from the municipal clerk. A municipality may file an action in Superior Court applying for an order to enjoin a person from using or displaying the municipal seal in violation of this section. A violation of this section is a class E crime. So to put it in perspective, at some point in our history, the state legislature and the governor at the time decided it was important to protect the seal of a city from implied use and unauthorized use by the city in which it has. So there is some sort of enforcement, and but more importantly, there's precedence on this. And by no means does this stop any eventuality but I think it does send a very valuable message that we do reiterate the importance of our seal, our name, our slogan, and any, any um, mottos that we might have. And, and I just, um, I, I appreciate this and, and I support this, but I just, the idea about any group soliciting funds from local, state, or federal sources. So uh, the Boy Scouts could say we wanna get funds from the Federal Boy Scouts organization but we want to put the seal of the city on it to be able to solicit the funds, right? Is that an example of a national soliciting funds from a national organization? It, it could be, yes. That is an exact example that would be covered by both state statute as well as this order. But more importantly, let's say the Boy Scouts of Maine apply for a national grant saying that they plan on spending X dollars in Maine on this number of projects. They're, excuse me, in Auburn, Maine, specifically. And they're using Auburn, they're using our seal. Um, they're using Auburn as a way to solicit funds. There's nothing to say that they would actually, within, the, within their application, use those funds in Auburn. So it is a checks and balances. So someone's gonna use our name and our seal and our logo. We wanna make sure that the purpose is actually a purpose that, for, by policy, the city council supports. And, and one last one, um, and again, I really appreciate the effort. Um, uh, 
would any proposed uh, moniker, logo, et cetera, come before the city council for approval? So say um, the fire department decides to come up with a logo for themselves, the city council would have to approve that logo before it could be used. Correct. Great, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Councilor McLeod. I, I just had one statement, uh, and again, I agree with all of this here. I'm just hoping as a city we can come up with a streamlined way to allow people to uh, have access to the seal and monikers and whatever graphics we so choose you know, in an easy way to, so we can keep track of who's using our, our um, likeness. They have to apply for it? They yeah. still have to get approval by the council for the use of. Right. Just a streamlined way for that to happen to them. Agreed. And have a, a package. And I think there might be in the future. I mean, there might be once we really get a full accountability and understanding of what's out there currently. Um, what we currently have as a city, there might be power that with a future ordinance or amendment to this order, we give to city manager or staff on certain areas so they can streamline it or the communications department, what have you. So, but I think first and foremost, we have to get a full understanding of what we have. I look forward to the moniker, whatever that is. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that hopefully in a minute, but uh, is there any other debate? Councilor Boss? Second to last sentence. Can we just add some language there to clarify that you need approval by the city council prior to the use of any logo, slogan, or variation of name prior to use? Because it's unclear whether it, you're asking for approval to use any existing logo or slogan, or if you're asking for approval to use a variation thereof. Would you like to make a motion to amend? I'd like to make a motion to amend the second sentence to state, any city created commission, board and committee, and any outside group receiving funds or city staff support must submit for approval by the city council before use of any logo, slogan, or variation of name. So right there, bef before use of. Just so it's clear that it's not, we're, a, we're not asking people to own, I mean, and I want clarification from you too, Mr. Mayor, that this is your intention, that you want all city committees and groups and departments to ask before using any of the currently allowed logo, slogan, city seal, etc. That's intent. That is intent. Right. So we just need to make that language a little bit more clear. Fair enough. So we have a motion to amend. Do we have a second? Second. All in favor of amending, as Councillor Boss just reiterated. I have a quick question on that. It, does that also strike prior to use at the end of that sentence? Okay. I think in the way that I restated it, I got rid of that. Okay. I just wanted to make we can sure. roll Agreed. back the tape on that okay. one. Because that would be a redundant <laughs> grammatical right. insertion. Okay. Uh, the amendment, uh, the motion to amend passes. <clears throat> Very good. Is there any other debate, comment on this? None? Okay. I'm going to ask Sue for another vote on this order or a roll call. Councillor Milks? Yes. Councillor Carrier? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Boss? Yes. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Lasagna? Yes. Councillor McLeod? Yes. <coughs> Passes by vote of 7 0. Um, <coughs> Councillor Gary? Before Mr. I open it. Mr. Mayor. Councillor Gary? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would like to suspend the rules. Oh, uh, excuse me. I'd like to suspend the rules to introduce a resolve. A resolve the city, the Auburn City Council hereby accepts and supports the Auburn. Your next is closer than you think as our approved slogan for use by the city and its departments, committees, boards, and commissions until further action by this council. Any other use of this slogan or campaign material in whole or in part by any other entity is strictly prohibited unless permission received from the city council and or authorized signature by the city, uh, Auburn city manager or his designee. Point uh, of order, don't we have to? Yeah, no, uh, we have a motion to suspend. Motion to suspend first. First, and then we're gonna, we'll run into that, thank you. So we have a motion to suspend on the floor by Councilor Gary. Do I have second. a second? Second. Second from Councilor McLeod. So the rules are suspended now. We'll entertain a motion at this time, Councilor Gary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Resolved, the Auburn City Council hereby accepts and supports the Auburn, your next, whatever you want to put in the spot, in parentheses, yeah. is closer than you think 
as our approved slogan for use by the city and its departments, committees, boards, and commissions until further action by this council. Any other use of this slogan or campaign material in whole or in part by any other entity is strictly prohibited unless permission received from the city council and or authorized signature so, I mean, signed by the Auburn city manager or his designee. A motion. Do I have a second? Second. A second for council carrier. Let me just, uh, if I could just paraphrase, basically that which we rolled out in our press conference would be the marketing slogan for the city of Auburn. Should you have some? Yeah. Uh, did you actually take a vote Didn't. after suspending the rules? <laughs> did I? No. No. Okay. Because we you. don't suspend rules very often. Maybe Pretend again. that happened. Hold on. Quick vote. <laughs> Quick vote. All those in favor of suspending the rules? Thank you. We are, the rules are suspended 7 0. I'm sorry about that. We're going to go back just a little bit in time. We have a motion for Councillor Gary. I'm not going to have her repeat it for a third time. <laughs> that would be just cruel and unusual. Um, and we have it seconded. It's on the floor right now. I'd like to paraphrase it. Basically, this marketing slogan that we rolled out would be the official slogan used by city departments, commissions, boards, activities. <laughs> if it's conservation, your next tree is closer than you think, and so forth. Your next home, your next job, your next business. Okay. Uh, we have to start somewhere. Just a question, and thank you. I appreciate this. Do we have an end date that we want to put on here for how long we use it, or? It's there like until it? further notice, until okay. changed by the council. So nobody knows what type of lifespan that slogan will have, long or short. Can I ask a question about that? So the Auburn, your next is closer than you think. Um, as we had on our video, there was different words there. Do we have any say in what the rec department is going to put there, or? Do you know what I'm saying? Is there is there any oversight as to what words are going to go in between the dot dot dot, or if, if any? I would let Councilor Gary, Councilor Gary, uh, Gary, want to answer that, but Curious. I will say I think it, that would be, and this is a great one to introduce as a first. It would be impossible to come up with every configuration. No, no, so, absolutely. Yeah. I just didn't know if it was coming. If, if the intent was for it to come at least back to the city manager before it was used, you know, in some sort of official fashion. Especially if it's one of his department people, it would have to come back. Okay. And if, it, if it's from a board commission or whatnot, that council rep would be bringing it back to the council, you'd think. Say, hey, oh, at this meeting we decided we'd do this new slogan, fit this word in. You'd give us the update. Okay. Yeah, it's something. yeah there, I think there, to your point, Council McLeod, about a streamlined process for approval. Yeah. I think Phil, I mean, you jump in here. It's pretty easy yeah. for you to. Well, let me. Run. Yeah, let me just give a little bit of uh, guidance. Um, so this order, and um, we can certainly work with it, as well as the previous order that was mentioned. Um, managing it, tracking it, um, those are those are challenges, and so know that as staff, we'll certainly do our best, um, and we'll uh, we'll work on educating. Um, department directors, those who are be using it. Um, but know that, you know, like was said, changing one of those names and bringing up back before a council for an update, I don't see that happening. Right. Um, but I can tell you that um, we can work on ensuring that any variations would come through my office um, and we would work on that. So that way there, we don't see something that's appearing that may be challenging for us as a community um, that we have to deal with. But just, just so you know, as we do some of these, what we'll work on internally is a good process, a process for requests, making that available on the website so it's easily accessible to someone who may be, um, may be wanting to apply for something. It's something we want to support so that we can process that and make that happen uh, are things that we will work on internally. So. We'll fix on failure. Do we need to change the order number? Yeah, I or, just did on mine. It's, it's oh, okay. One, three, one, not zero. I just grabbed that to put it out when I printed my form. Oh, we're on the Very good. Councilor, I'm sorry, Councilor Walker, yeah. was that you? My, my question is, uh, it says permission received by city council and or authorized sign. Is that saying that if the council doesn't look at it, the manager can sign or his designee at any time? Uh, it I, means that if he contra if the city contracts for a service and he's got the authority and we've approved it, he's got authority to, to do it to sign it. My question is, if it doesn't come to council, 
goes straight to the city manager. The way I read this, he could actually sign off or his designee. I want to know, can he or can he? Because can at this, point. this already happened to us once, and I, I want to make right. sure we know what we're talking about here. I, I think the council should have to give the authority, and then he can sign. Okay, that's fine. Well, if I, and I just to back, this is, well, just to clarify, because I understand your situation with the logo beforehand, that, would, that was covered in the order that was just passed. It has to come from city council, no deviation. This is only about the use of that name, Auburn, or excuse me, that slogan, where your next blank looks closer than you think, okay? So where that's being used, it's for marketing of Auburn. It's right here, committees, boards, and so forth, and in the recreation department. So it's not like you can blow this up and do whatever you want. It's only very specific for this one initiative. So I just don't think that changing it might and I, I throw this out there, I don't think changing it is necessary. It would actually create more work on this because it's just about this specific slogan. It's not a, a logo. Gotcha. Yeah. So what Councillor Walker is saying though, it does say and or, so it, would it be feasible to take out the and, or take out that and have it be authorized that we're, to what he's saying, we are authorizing the city manager to do that because it's not going to come back to council for every variation or you know what i mean or every use or, or every use for that matter right we're, we're granting that authority from we did it in the last order that that stuff comes to us so this particular part would just be the the city manager's purview if you the council want to just if you you all want to delegate the duty to the manager yeah you can but right now it's both either way that's up to you if you want to make that motion to amend I, would, well, I figured his designee could be his assistant city manager. Yeah, if he or his designee, yeah. I just have a concern with it being the either or. Either it's us or it's the city, the city's manager, assistant manager. You know what I mean? It, or, mm -hmm. it doesn't need to be both. One of us needs to pick and, and then we do it. A good example is this slogan will be used in a media um, <clears throat> buy that we are doing. I would rather not have to come back before you to right. say we're about ready to push this out on a media buy. Yeah. This is a slogan that you've now approved through this order right. and then allowing the city manager to sign and give that authorization out, I think is all you really need at this point. And you could remove the city council component, leave city manager and or designee. Do you want to make a motion to amend that language? I think that would be the correct way. Yeah. Get rid of the and and R. Yeah, just go get rid of the and, strike the and, and go or. Uh, oh, excuse me, oh, no. strike city council, I'm sorry. Um, permission received from the city manager or his, or his designee. designee. That would be the language. Would you so like to moved. make that? Yes. Okay, we have a motion from Councillor um, McLeod. Second. To, do we have a second? Second, second Councillor Boss. Councillor Greg? I'll second it. Okay. Uh, all those in favor of changing the language? Okay, very good. So the order is now amended to, re to say strictly prohibited unless permission received from uh, the city manager or his designee. Okay. Is there any other debate or conversation about this? Marketing slogan, none being. I'll ask Sue for a vote. Clarification, um, is this an order or resolve? Sorry, it's a, re it's a resolve. It's a resolve. Okay, so the number will not be 131. I believe I would have to look at the last agenda, but I believe it's going to be resolve 13 12072020. Whichever. I mean, I just grabbed it to sure. print out the paper. So it's resolved. Okay, Sue, can we get a roll call vote, please? Okay, Councillor Milks. Yes. Councillor Carrier? Yes. Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Boss? Yes. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Lasagna? Yes. Councillor McLeod? Yes. Resolve passes by vote of 7 0. Okay, we'll now get back to our regularly scheduled agenda. I'm going to go with the open session. This is the last open session of the night. <laughs> members of the public are invited to speak to the council about any issue concerning city business that does not appear on tonight's agenda. If there's anyone in the community room, please stand to the podium. Councilor Walker will check for us. We're in the clear. 
Okay, we're going to go down to the reports. First, Mayor's report. Um, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to uh, move to suspend the rules. I got a motion to suspend. Excuse me, I have a motion on the floor to suspend the rules. Do I have a second? Second. I have a second from Councillor Carrier. All those in favor of suspending the rules? Seven zero. We the rules are now suspended. Mr. Mayor and the council, I'd like to propose a resolve um, based on the crisis that we have with our children today's in today's society and here in Maine and City of Auburn. Um, number of kids, and I'll I, I will I will read from uh, an NPR article, but it's resolve. It's in reference to our. Uh, let me read the resolve. Let it be known, based on the needs and wants of the residents of Auburn and the physical and psychological needs of our youth, the council resolves for the school committee to implement a plan for our youth to return to school at least four days per week starting January 4th. I think it's critical and our children are in crisis. They are... Hold on, uh, Councilor Milks. Yep. I was talking that you, you just made a motion yep. to enter that Sorry. resolve. I'm now going to ask her a second. Do I have a second on that motion? Second. I have a second from Councillor Gary. Now I'll open this up to Council. Councillor Carrier, or excuse me, Councillor um, Milks. I'll, I'll, I will quote from an NPR article that, that was released last week. Um, from, this is quoting a pediatrician, Danielle Dooley, Medical Director, Children's National Hospital, Washington, D.C., told NPR, as a pediatrician, I am see, really seeing the negative impacts of these school closures on children. Further in the article, going to school is really vital for our children. They get their meals in school, their physical activity, their health care, their education, of course. We've seen recently a, a tr absolute tragedy at the end of last week in Brunswick. I personally know of a number of children that have been hospitalized. I, this is a crisis for the children. They are at minimal risk to the virus. And it's absolutely critical that we send this, that our, we have our kids go back to school. And with imminent school, there's talking about closing the schools and going full remote. Any other comment, Councilor Rosani? Thank you, Councillor Milks. Um, I share your concern. But I'd like to hear from Councillor Carrier. Is there any information you can give us about the school, the school board, the teachers, the superintendent, and their feelings about this? The uh, motion was made by uh, a representative from the school board to make plans for uh, going back to school at the end of the break. Uh, they are in, <clears throat> they are looking at a plan to be able to do that should the uh, board uh, move so. Uh, there was also a survey that was sent out, uh, probably one of the best surveys that we've had done probably in the last 15 years <clears throat> that was uh, very well uh, represented by the number of students that took part, which was, I believe, 900 and something students. Uh, 1,250 some odd parents took part in it and then 300 teachers. Uh, and pretty much the overwhelming feel for the, the overall was that the students and the parents uh, thought we should be returning to school. Uh, parents, I believe it was upwards of 58 to 62 percent wanted the kids to go back at least four days. I can't re remember exactly the percentage. It was broken up in sort of an odd way. It was one being, yeah, no, we don't need to go back to five, yes, we need to go back. So if you look at the high ends and the low ends, it was 13 to 60 some odd percent They're going back to school for the parents, upwards of 40 to 50 percent for the kids wanting to go back. And then uh, with the teachers, it was the exact flip. Uh, only probably about 16 to 18 percent of the student or the teachers wanted to go back uh, as things stand currently. So, uh, but this was, as I said, one of the most representative surveys uh, and well uh, participated in by the students and the parents that we've had done, so. Do, do you know if the survey was uh, translated? In all honesty, I don't. Uh, in the past, they have tried to make sure that they have a lot of uh, 
uh, of the stuff that we put out, uh, translated it at least to the, uh, what I would say, the main languages, uh, Somalian and things like that. Uh, but I do not, I can't be completely sure of exactly what was translated and what wasn't. Were the people- I'm sorry, uh, one question or? I just want to be fair to everybody, so I'm going to turn it over to Councilor Bilks. Had his hand up. We can come back to you once everybody has a chance. I'll come. And additionally, in this particular article, NPR, despite widespread concerns, two new international studies show no consistent relationship between in-person K through 12 schooling and the spread of coronavirus. And a third study from the United States shows no elevated risk to childcare workers who stayed on the job. There's, it's. And there, that's what this, what's the studies are saying. I, and very good. And I just got a confirmation the surveys were translated. So, is there any other questions? Do Councilor McLeod, we know when, the, Councilor, when did the surveys go out for, for, um, for questions? We received them at the, I mean, it was totaled by uh, Shelley at the last meeting, so I will so assume. November 2nd, I want to say. I got it. I filled mine out. I'll look. I was just curious, I was just curious what our, our, uh, designation was when the survey went out that's all i believe it was, it was the first week of november the first week of November. Okay. yeah we were Thanks. still green at that point we okay. went to yellow what was it last week last thursday or mm -hmm. and i will tell you that uh as of just a couple of minutes ago we uh have three more cases cool. right now and just to be a little bit more descriptive on that. I'm looking for my email. So three more cases, one student from Ever Little, staff from Support Services, and a staff from Auburn Hall. So one in school, two out. And, well, I've got uh, EL Central Office and Bus Monitor. Okay, that's support, okay. That's, yeah, the staff, staff support member, services. Support Services. So those three, two adults, one student at Ever Little. And that was at 545, that was when we get the notice. Councilor Zani. Thank you. Do you know why the teachers had the reverse uh, desire compared to the parents in the? In there the were several. I don't have enough. I didn't yeah, bring I'm enough sorry, coffee I for everybody. I, I probably should have brought more of them, uh, but it's viewable uh, on the school site. Uh, they were had several different topics. Uh, the, one of them was the. Uh, uh, they think the PPE is insufficient. Uh, we had some concerns about contract tracing. Uh, there was three or four of them, uh, but I, those are the ones that stand out. And this, just to be clear, this survey was done when we were still in green? Yeah, I think, what, I mean, if I could, I mean, we're talking about surveys, we're talking about what teachers think. And I think that if, I definitely would hold that, all those minutia out to the school board and their, their staff. I will say we're here to represent the residents in their entirety of Auburn and not the respondents of a survey. Um, and I just, and I don't want to speak for you, but I just want to keep this conversation focused on the resolve at hand, okay? And the resolve was for our children to get them back in school by, I, I'm sorry, a date? Fourth of, fourth of January, when they're yeah. supposed to go back after the new year. So talking about debate and keeping the conversation focused on the students and what's the best needs based upon our um, elected responsibilities for those students and their families, Keep the fire, that would help this go along a little bit, so. Uh, it's very clear to me at this point that the risk to the kids of not going to school is far greater than the risk going to school. You've got long-term psychological and social breakdowns happening because of these school closures. Councilor Carrier. One other thing. And I'm I sorry, Councilor Carrier, can you speak into the microphone? <laughs> I can't even hear you. Enough. Everybody can hear me. Uh, there was a survey that came out today, and I will apologize for not knowing whether it was from Maine or not. Uh, but there is a survey, or not a survey, but a study that's done that uh, currently uh, they're thinking about dropping the grading system back to basically uh, having some kind of grades system. And I'm not completely sure if that's only here in Maine or whether it's outside of it, uh, because the number of fail, and I hate using that word, the number of the children that are not making standard at this point has increased three to five percent. I will say as a father, and this is just as a parent speaking, a father of a freshman at high school, the consistency level 
at the current hybrid two on two off model is not conducive at all. Um, it just doesn't work. And I can't blame teachers because I gotta tell you, when you're ma managing large groups and to have that many different options um, and that many different variables with the side of your organization and to add even more variables through this, it's almost an untenable situation for a teacher. It really truly is. Um, so it's very, very tough. I think, you know, I would, if I had a vote on this, weigh the pros and cons of risk versus reward and what is the greatest risk out there for children not being in school, what are the side effects, and if they were in school close to full time, still walking under a, working under a yellow designation because that means hybrid is mandatory. A four day is hybrid. Five days full time is the only definition. Um, yeah, it would, it would be, uh, I definitely want to weigh the pros and cons of everything and make sure the, you know, the cure isn't better than the disease here and to see if we're in an at-risk situation. I did talk with someone today um, about educators in England who's been, they've been under total lockdown now for some time, not their schools. So they've been going to school full time since the second lockdown, which is currently in place. So I think there's some case studies for everybody to weigh here across the country and, 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 and internationally. And the science is, is coming out a lot clearer than it was in February, March, April, that's for sure. Well, and I think it's really illustrative that in England they are closing down businesses to allow the schools to be open as opposed to what we're doing in America, many places where we're keeping businesses open and closing the schools. It's different, that's for sure. Um, I think sometimes we're closing businesses too. I've, I've talked to some businesses that are fearful of that, but. Councilor, anybody? Anybody else? Councilor McLeod? <clears throat> Councilor Carrier, the school committee. Hi. The school committee is, is looking into trying to see what can be done for a four day. Brought up in the, in, as, uh, by one of the committee members to see what we needed to do to get back. And that's when they brought out the survey and sort of uh, ran that bias to see where we, you know, just to add information. It'll be coming up in future meetings. Okay. So, I, I mean, I personally feel that we should stay in our lane on that, that the school committee is already working on that and has an elected body and we have a, vo a voice on that committee. I, I, wouldn't, I, I just want to remind everybody about our meetings that we had in August and September, specifically talking with the school committee during joint meetings and the time we had our superintendent and the chair here asking for several deliverables back to the city council, i.e. what was the plan? I think we believe we gave them a deadline in, on November. It was actually after November 15th. Council Kerry, I know there's been subsequent discussions about this in school committee of what does going back to school four days or full time look like? What will the use of the audio visual upgrades within the school, when will they be live? How will that be rolled out and utilized? Um, as well as the total count of students in classrooms, courses, and what have we lost to uh, private institutions or homeschooling? So there is an outstanding list of questions that have been asked and uh, directions that have been given that we still have yet to get feedback on. Um, and we're about a month past two. Hey, things happen, I'm not you know, raising a sink, but I just wanna re remind everybody that we have asked for some of this before. Um, and we do, again, to stay in your lane, we have a responsibility for the entire city. There's by state statute things we cannot do. Okay, uh, we've talked about that just our last meeting, but this is within the realm through a resolve of asking as a representative of the city. So Can I ask another question. Um, in terms of um, Councilor Carrier, the things that the, the, the teachers are concerned about are there are will those things be addressed by January 4th? Because I think it's important. They've come up with things that they need to be able to feel comfortable. And I wonder if that's going to happen. We would be looking at all of it. I, digging in my files, I found it. I can't figure out a way to, some one of you tech savvy people will have to help me. I can break that out and send it to you. Uh, but yes, we'd have to address, from a, a standpoint of the committee, we would have to address all of that to be able to make sure that, one, the, the students and the parents are good with sending back, but you also have to make sure that your staff is good with sending everybody back. Because as we have seen uh, with COVID as it's progressed, it's great that, to say that we're going to send back kids to school, but if we have two cohorts and both the teachers come down sick, mm -hmm. there are no replacements. Uh, actually, Superintendent Brown uh, was out teaching uh, during one of the last episodes because there were no teachers. There was no one left. So. All of that has to be taken into consideration. 
Council, uh, excuse me, Mr. Manager. Councilor Mooks, could you just repeat the, the resolve one more time? Based on the needs and wants of the residents of Auburn and the physical and psychological needs of our youth, the council resolves for the school committee to implement a plan for our youth to return to school at least four days per week starting January 4th. So I just Here, want to I make copies of it. I'm sorry. Oh. I just want to make sure it's clear as, as mentioned regarding staying in lane. So as a council, as a resolve, it just means it's your opinion yes. and your recommendation. There's no authority as a council to move in that direction, but it is just your opinion that you're now sharing to the school committee to move in that direction of creating a plan. Uh, just Hang so on. that the public is aware, regardless of how your vote comes out, that's still up to the school board to make that determination. And, and does it seem feasible, because I, I think Councilor Mills is being very specific here in a good way, that the school committee to implement a plan. It doesn't mean that the school committee then commands that all the children go back on the fourth. It's just implementing a plan. And Councilor Carrier, does it seem it's in, that it's within the capacity of the school committee to implement a plan by January fourth? I would no, say I know you're the I start saying, you're the proxy. Under best case circumstances, I would say sure we could do anything by January fourth because we're talking about a month out, mm -hmm. but. In actuality, there are a lot of moving parts with that. Mm -hmm. And to say, oh, yeah, we could do that in a month, I, I would hesitate to be able to say that because let's, simply because of the logistics. You're talking eight schools, 3,500 kids, roughly 600 uh, teachers and support staff. Yeah, but they were working on a four day back in August. Remember, they, We've they got actually a, you there approved is a it. Plan the plan is there. Shifting from one to the other because mm -hmm. you've, you also have to remember that the high school's classes were developed this. Uh, the first two semesters were developed on a specific way of, of being able to attend to come back in now and say okay we're going to change all that well now you're talking about changing all the schedules mm -hmm. for all the high schools that's a thousand kids so you know in, under best case circumstances i'm sure that you know we might be able to get something done but in all actuality it would probably be past that date uh, so because you have to to get all the moving parts moving in the right direction so if we think about it, I mean, you could change the conversation to more logistics and feasibility and only vote based upon what we think right now is a feasibility of implementation. But I, I want to, I, it's my responsibility to get you back to the gist of this resolve. And Councilor, you, Councilor, you introduced this. So if I'm off, please, you know, tell me I'm off. But this is about the psychological needs of our youth and the children and whether or not we believe as a council that this is important for the youth, right? Correct? Councilor Gary? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Our students, our kids, children, whatever you'd like to call them, whatever the phrase is, need structure. They need routine. They need accountability. Our teachers are trying hard through Zoom and whatever else how they teach. And the parents have to try to make sure the kids are following and they're trying to keep up with their studies. But it isn't, going, it isn't happening. It's hard because our parents have to work, and so they're not there 24-7 with their kids trying to figure out if they are doing what they're supposed to do for lessons. So there's little accountability because they're not the, got the structure of having to be there in person. At least if they were in person and they didn't understand something, the teacher could catch it or the uh, tech could catch it and give that person, that student, the education whatever he needs or she needs to keep forward. I support this resolution because of like what was said, the emotional needs. Do we want our kids sitting at home taking Zoom classes? And like the one that the good council talked about, shut off his... Uh, that was a different one. But the one that you were... There was a young student, he was on Zoom, he shut down the volume and stuff, and he killed himself. Do you want to, because he figured there was nothing else to do in life. He couldn't go for his sports, they've been canceled. He couldn't get out of the house to mingle with his fellow students. How many more kids is it going to take that we're gonna lose or give even more psychological problems because of the isolation? How many kids? You guys say one life due to covert is too many. What about all these kids that we're putting through the ringer right now? I'm supporting this. Councilor Carrier, then Councilor Milks. 
I will point out something to you that you, you already know. The, the council can make recommendations. Uh, the school committee will make the decision, but we also have to take into consideration uh, what comes out of the Department of Education. Uh, just as uh, the good councilwoman just said, we've cut off the sports. Well, the, we had made a, uh, had a discussion the other night in regards to winter sports. Well, the state changed that again. Now the winter sports will not start when they thought they were going to be able to, and now we're two weeks later. So just remembering, and as you all well know, <clears throat> this is nothing more than saying we would like the school committee to consider getting the kids back. But in reality, it's not going to be that because there's the logistics of it, there's the Department of Education part of it, there's, there's a lot of moving parts that you're talking about. Mr. Mayor? Councilor Melks. I just would also like to add, it's safe for kids. The chances of a child dying from COVID is astronomically low. That's according to the CDC. Of all the deaths of people under the age of 25, less than 1% of those deaths of all cause were caused by COVID. The, uh, your average teenager has a much higher chance of getting killed driving to school than dying of COVID. It's safe for the, kill, for the, ch for the children. What we're talking about is adults and grown-ups that are feeling that they're not safe, but it is safe for the kids and they are taking the brunt of this, all of the things that are going on. It's safe for the kids. They are not at risk. It's just not true. The kids are not at risk. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this to a vote um, on the resolve. I'm going to read the resolve one more time. I want to make sure everybody sees this or hears it because it's not on the agenda. Uh, let it be known, based on the, let it be known, Auburn City Council resolved on December 7th, 2020, based on the needs and wants of the residents of Auburn and the physical and psychological needs of our youth. This council resolves for the school committee to implement a plan for our youth to return to school at least four days per week starting January 4th. Excuse me. I'm going to ask the uh, city clerk for a roll call vote. Thank you. Councillor Milks? Yes. Councillor Carrier? I'm abstaining. Uh, Councillor Walker? Yes. Councillor Boss? No. Councillor Gary? Yes. Councillor Lasagna? No. Councillor McLeod? No. Okay, so Mayor Levesque, you break the tie. Jesus, this has been what? First time all year, isn't it? The mayor votes yes. Resolve passes by vote of 4 3, with one abstention. Okay, moving along. Reports. Uh, starting with the mayor's report. Uh, I have only one thing to report, and then I have a question or two for a couple counselors as you report too, so bear with me on that. Uh, one, mayor's ad hoc. We should be sending out surveys on, to our chairs of our boards, commissions uh, in the next week to two to find meetings for Zoom times so that we can all talk as a mayor's ad hoc committee and the boards and commissions chairs to talk about the proposal with the idea of bringing this back to January for a final deliberation, a final vote. Um, so I want to make sure everybody knows how that's going on. Comp plan has started, uh, comp plan review rather has started and that will continue through the use of subcommittees and the overall committee and trying to escalate this process. So off week subcommittees a week and then the uh, committee will meet during once a month at least, maybe more. So. That's how we're going to kind of operate on this one in order to become more efficient and effectual. That's all I have right now. City councilors, any reports? Councilor Carrier? Uh, with the school committee, uh, there are some changes that have been made that uh, we're going to have to give consideration to uh, that will be a topic for us when it comes to budget. Uh, and there'll be some very hard decisions that will have to be made this year. So just prepping you up front uh, because to maintain what we have currently, which is the contractual raises and the, just the cost increases, we're looking at almost another $2 million in the school budget with nothing else. So just so that you know that those are coming and uh, that was part of the discussions we had with the school board uh, and given the 
uh, Ms. Eastman's report later on tonight, <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll have that starting up front. Uh, there would have been some questions about why I told them what I did, and having discussed it with each one of you uh, last year about how it was always us against them, uh, I gave them an expectation and is what, is what I thought it should be, so that there would be no surprises. If, if things are as bad as we think they're going to be, then they know where we're at. If things are better than what we thought they were going to be, then we can improve what we do. But setting the expectation early allows us to say, well, you knew go going in, so it's not an us versus you, you knew going in. It's just like with the rest of the departments, there's, with the city manager working with them, they know going in what the situation is going to be, so it can't be an us versus them. We're a city, we have to operate together, that's the reason I gave them their expectation. And Councilor Carrier, on that note, if I could, um, and just for all the counselors, we do have a joint meeting on December 21st. School committee, city council will be getting together, talking about the budget implications. That's also a regular scheduled meeting for us as well. Um, if there are any questions that we think need to be answered prior to that meeting, please all send them to Councilor Carrier so he can be our conduit in. It'll be more efficient that way. For example, the one question I have, and I'll send this in an email to the counselor, is I want a list of all high school classes and enrollment for first this first half of this year. Uh, there are a lot of classes, and one of the reasons they couldn't do four-day learning was because the, the number of classes that they offered logistically didn't make sense. I would like to know if those classes are actually filled post-fact or if they have one, two, or three individuals or more. Okay, or four. Um, what is the minimum, in other words, to run a class effectively? Um, so if we could get that information, that would be great. I'll put in an email. But again, from a policy or, or excuse me, a standard operating procedure, funnel everything through Councilor Carrier. That way we could get those answers in hand before the meeting on the 21st or during it. Okay? Thank you. Any other Councilor? Let's just go in order. Councilor Walker? I don't have anything. We've got, we've got hearings for the uh, water and sewer budgets. Uh, coming up this week, so you can find out that information if you're interested in those budget hearings. You got Councilor Gary? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This is more of point of information on Mr. McEwen. Norm McEwen, he was owner and operator of Ann Flower Shop in Auburn, and he successfully served the community from 1959 until his retirement in 2004. Norm was a past president of the MSFA, Maine State Floral Association, and was the recipient of the Ed Johnson Award in 1980 from them. He was also a member of the Knights of Columbus, the Auburn School Committee from 1984 to 1987, Auburn City Council from 1988 to 1994, Auburn Housing Commissioner from 1995 to 2010, and Chairman of the Board from 2004 and 2010. He retired from this board at, in 2015. He was also very instrumental in bringing the Boys and Girls Club to Auburn, which made him very proud. He will always be remembered for his love of spending time, quality time with his family and his commitment to this community. He will deeply be missed by many. Councilor McLeod? Nope. Councilor Lozani? No. Councilor Boss? One quick update. The Auburn Public Library is now doing curbside only for picking up books. Um, due to the exponential growth of positive cases of COVID in our community. They do have limited computer availability, but by appointment only. That's my update. Hey, Councilor Boss, two things. First on the library, um, I noticed that they were the recipient of a substantial PPP loan. Um, I think it was 150 or $200,000 for the payroll protection plan. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize that not, they could actually qualify for that, but how is that putting their budget? Do you have any idea or sense as we come into budget season how this will either negatively affect or positively affect their budget, flatline it? I need to ask and follow up. Okay. Second, uh, Ag Committee. I just want to remind you of the emergency order, executive order that was ratified by the City Council. Um, it's Order 01 0502 2020, talking about the priorities of work for the Ag Committee. I've looked over the minutes 
for August and September Ag Committee. I found very little work done on this executive order. There's been mention of prioritizing and then some of these bullets not doing. Um, I just wanna see if we can get a report back by next meeting or the January meeting, depending upon your Ag Committee schedule, um, addressing all of these bullet points. Happily. Okay, thank you. As of last week, we had our first meeting where we were fully had all of our members and so we're now at nine as opposed to seven members so we are finally at our group number we have been working on the priorities we chose to prioritize five out of the nine bullets and we'd be happy to give an update on all of the work we've been doing that's great thank you okay no other reports turning it over to the city manager thank you mr mayor i have a few updates first uh, if you recall we've talked about a joint use agreement for fields and access with the school department uh, that joint use agreement has been signed by the superintendent and myself. So that's one step moving forward with having access to those fields um, and being in compliance with the land and water conservation uh, commission's uh, requirement as far as being able to access um, those fields that have received grant funding. So that has been submitted to the state as a step in the right direction for us in com coming into compliance. Also regarding COVID, uh, staff continues to make adjustments with procedures uh, as guidelines change. One of the most recent guideline changes is regarding quarantine. New changes came out regarding that from the state. And so we are adjusting our policies uh, to ensure that we're covering that with staff. Uh, we're strongly encouraging committees to meet remotely. We have set up Zoom access for chairs to be able to create these Zoom meetings, be able to promote that. Uh, we will be, um, as the mayor mentioned, uh, meeting with the chairs, uh, talking about several things, but also regarding uh, these procedures as well to ensure that we're all on the same page. At the end of last week, uh, we had um, uh, obviously a large spike as you're seeing the numbers increase, not just with uh, across the state, but also within the city of Auburn. I think we had about 147 cases within just a couple weeks here in Auburn. Uh, those numbers have increased again for this year. I'm sorry, this week. Um, Matt is working on his update for you. I apologize that has not come out with uh, Thanksgiving um, and providing him just some really well time away. Um, but even during that, he uh, was screening several calls. We had 12, um, 12 outbreaks last week. We have nine this week. Um, so those require a great deal of time. The state is no longer tracing or investing people um, resources. If there's 18 to 65 age uh, contact, unless the person is living in a congregate living or a public safety or a healthcare uh, uh, facility or access into public safety. Uh, the reason for that is just they do not have the resources to be able to do all, all of that contact tracing. Um, mentioned already about our daily average uh, increasing so we are working on ensuring uh, as far as internally here within the city uh, that our staff are well protected taking all the, the appropriate precautions um, the deputy chief fivefield as our safety coordinator has recommended that the council and school committee consider virtual meetings that is obviously up to the council as you move forward but that recommendation was brought forward and I wanna make sure I'm sharing that with you. Uh, staff will be prepared to respond in any way that the council takes in that. Um, the last storm that we just had uh, this last weekend, uh, public safety, PW and electrical crews did a great job uh, out there. You already you heard a little bit from Dan regarding that, um, but it's a very difficult storm that we had. Um, huge impact on the community. Um, last night, I think around seven o'clock i was watching the uh, numbers within C cmp saw that, that we had close to 1400 um, homes in auburn that still had no power so i contacted the uh, parks and rec director she stood up the warming center um, first thing in the morning her and her team uh, so that was available we made that as public as we could and, and pushed it out uh, through uh, andrew scargan ema as well as different um, media sites uh, we did have several people come and take advantage of that. Um, we are now, when I came into this meeting, uh, we currently have about 200 CMP customers that currently do not have power. So that obviously came down a great deal from 
uh, this morning at 1400. We, um, we will not be standing up the warming center tomorrow. We will do it on a case by case basis. So we encourage people if they need shower facilities, a warming site or charging use to just call uh, the Auburn Parks and Rec Department and they will uh, make that appointment available for you. Our challenge with this is that we also have the Auburn Adventures program that's running. We're serving over 200 children um, for childcare um, at the Hasty. And so being able to use that act, that center fully is really critical for the staff that we have allocated. So we will do it on a case by case basis. Mr. Manager, that's it, Mr. Mayor. When does one of the funds end? I believe we're using CARES funds for the Auburn Adventure Program. So I think we have that until the end of this year. The end of 2020, not current, the fiscal year. Not current, yes, calendar year. So at the end of 2020, unless we appropriate money for that, um, or unless the kids go back to school four days a week, we will not be able to or continue. Or if continued funding comes from the state. Or, if or an extension. Most of these we've been seeing extensions. So if extension comes and we still have funding, we're not necessarily seeing more funding just an extension on the money that we currently have. Yeah, very good, thank you. Mr. Manager, I just, um, in terms of responding to uh, Deputy Chief Fifield and his recommendation, does the council take up any kind of a conversation about addressing what he said at, about meeting remotely? I'll, I'll address that as the mayor. Okay. The council can at any time propose with the support of two councilors, any type of order or resolve that they would like to do, whether it be a workshop or action. I will state that I believe it would be a disservice uh, to not lead from the front and in person. I believe we are all critical workers in the city and that we should be treated as such. EMS, police, our teachers are being asked to show up to work. I believe the least we could do is show up to work. Um, and this is where we show up to work. So I will not be in favor of supporting or encouraging at home meetings unless City Hall is burning down around me. Can City Hall ever be closed, Mr. Manager? So we do not see any reason to close City Hall at this point. We still have a really low amount of customers that are coming in. I think of a lot of our customers, we're used to online service. I think uh, we do have some spikes during certain parts of the day. Uh, some of our funding for our monitor that we've had down in Auburn Hall, that funding goes away December 11th. Uh, so we will be moving forward without a monitor. We'll encourage staff to um, keep an eye on that, ensure that our numbers inside the building aren't exceeding. People are still maintaining good distance, but that does put a lot of added resources, um, but we do not see a need to close Auburn Hall at this time. Thank you. Go on to, I'm sorry, Councilor Walker. This thing always seems like it goes to hell on me. I, I would like a copy of your agreement with the school department for the parks that we may be involved with the school department. I'd like to see that. Sure, I'll make that available. And I'd like also the PowerPoint that Dan had. I'd like a paper copy of that as well. I can make one in your box for you available. Thank you. And, um, I'm sorry, one last thing. In terms of the scheduling that Councilor Walker um, uh, refers to there was some discussion about having a, a, a combined scheduling system so that both the school and the city were able to go in and, and do scheduling and see what was going on and individuals could schedule is that still in the works so that might be best for me to give you an update a little later when I have more information I know the school department had moved forward with a scheduling um, system that ties into their uh, programming. Um, so, um, and I think it was just part of the package that they had. Um, and, and we're doing the same thing. You had funded for, for that program. We have that, we will have that available. We'll use that as part of our scheduling. Now the question is how do we make the two systems kind of connect? But, so those conversations are happening, but it's, it's at a department level and uh, I can get you more information for that. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to the finance report. Ms. Eastman, the floor is yours. Um, the report that you have uh, is from October. I actually started working on the November one today. So, um, but um, the numbers looked good at the end of October. We were 1.1 million over anticipated um, budget for revenue, higher than last year. 
same time uh, the the um, there were three major items that were uh, over one was property taxes and homestead exemption which we knew the homestead would be higher excise tax and state revenue sharing they were all more than last year at this time um, and the expenditures were high which I had pointed out to you last month um, I did some of the transfers earlier than I did last year so that spikes the expenditures but it will come into line um, they're one-time transfers the TIFs and the workers comp uh, I really don't have um, any major concerns and the numbers that I looked at today for revenues were continuing to this trend of being higher than last year so for right now things look very good for our budget for this year we have any questions for Ms. Eastman on this on the October report None. I've got a couple um, so we're five months into the fiscal year Ms. Eastman and we're looking at just kind of focusing on some expenditures here as well I just want to clarify that the workman's comp um, is higher simply because it was made earlier not an increase in rate right we transfer that we have a separate fund for workers comp mm -hmm. we're self-insured for workers comp and so the general fund we budget a certain amount of money for our, the city's side portion of that we um, pay for the claims obviously and then we also pay for a third-party administrator um, and then the school has a portion they also fund their portion of that workers comp okay, so we haven't seen actually our our claims are down from where they were last year okay, so but that's in a different actually a different fund than this it's in a, a workers comp fund and um, it's tracked separately thank you uh, second when we're talking about uh, accrual of interest interest has gone down to 0.9 percent are we are our accounts primarily variable rate or are they fixed on interest uh, they're they're fixed um, I have most of our stuff at Androscoggin now because I got the best rate from them um, we're down though however from one and a half to I think we're down at 0. about 0. 0.7 right now um, as of the end of uh, November I mean so they're trying to keep it keep it at higher than because it's higher than CDs uh -huh. I'm getting more from Androscoggin than I was getting on CDs so I've taken the money out of the CDs when it matured mm -hmm. at this point so you're not with the amount of so just back to income really quickly here uh, dispersed distri distributions from the state they seem to be at our or above projections so far this fiscal year correct yes kind of what I'm hearing from Augusta as well that expectations are a little they're running a little higher than they thought in the in the beginning of COVID okay well we were actually we actually were conservative though when we budgeted so we didn't budget the total amount that they said they were going to give us because of COVID and and we're tracking higher than what we budgeted um, but you know it could it could get worse as we go farther in especially with income tax and that type of thing because that's a huge portion portion of um, revenue sharing personal income tax oh uh, thank you and you you might not have this handy but I just want to highlight on the expenditures water and sewer if you all remember we had this conversation and a resolve out to the Auburn Water Department to somehow uh, help us with this surely what we thought was an extremely exorbitant above consumer increase and in our city water fees for hydrants um, that came out to about $160,000, I believe roughly, right? Increased on an annualized basis. We did ask and talk about having an independent study done, and I'm not sure if that's moving forward, if that made it. That was during the transition period, Phil, between Peter and you. That is not on my radar at this point, but I can go back and look at it. Yeah, and see I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, you're part of those talks as, as well, looking at what our true rates are for fire protection. Other municipalities have done so, because if it's not, checked then our rates are going to continue to go up by almost double what the residential rate is due to some archaic very very old yeah. uh, legislative it has action. to do with the, the way the PUC and the, the the formulas it's a it's a formula based which I don't fully understand but the the rates are based there's when you raise the residential rates 
it automatically triggers what the unless you have a third party independent study showing what your true cost of fire protection is that would trump that and that's something that we need to look at before our next budget or else we'll see a sizable increase um again um very good is there any other questions on finance councilor carrier then councilor walker track to retire about 9.3 million dollars uh, worth of the uh, total you know, bond, bonds bonds yeah yes that includes the city and the school okay would you just explain public safety more than last year what what is i don't remember last year's cost <laughs> You got here 124, 373. Yeah, that's what it came up. Um, and I don't have the detail right here, but I can, I can get that for you and send it out. Um, I'd have to look at each line item to see what, where it went up. Just explain public safety. I, I'm not getting it it's in, in my brain. It's mostly fire, okay. uh, fire and EMS. Okay, thank you. Yep. So I can probably give a couple updates on that. So talking with the fire chief, a lot of that has to do with the overtime. Uh, so we currently have overtime that's being driven. If we have several uh, firefighters uh, that have been quarantined, then we, we need to, uh, we need to uh, re replace them with overtime. Uh, if they've been exposed on a patient contact um, and the state is requiring them to be quarantined, then we're, we're doing that as well through main EMS. So that, uh, most of that is being driven by, by fire and be driven by uh, their overtime account. So I, I would hope that later down the road here, the state is gonna find a way of helping us to be able to pay these costs because we're transporting people like every day of the week that have this problem and we're not supposed to catch it, but of course it happens. So I would hope that somehow there's a mechanism that's gonna say to the state, uh, that here's our numbers, this is how we fell in the hole give us help and hand. So what we did when we set up the three, three different cares, uh, keep Maine healthy fund, um, sorry, keep Maine healthy fund. Uh, we did allocate and what hasn't happened yet is transferring, uh, money that came in through that grant will be transferred to, uh, Auburn fire department and other departments, uh, for salary offsets uh, as a result of some of this, that will happen later on when the grant closes, that grant does not close till December 11th. So those, uh, those amounts will shift. Probably you won't see them, Jill, in probably the January report probably. Yeah, I would think. Yeah. Well, hopefully there'll be another one to follow. Okay, no other finance questions? Very good. Thank you, Jill. Um, I'll just take a motion to accept and place on file the October 2020 monthly financial report. So moved. Second. Uh, motion Councilor Carrier, second from Councilor McLeod. All those in favor? Opposed? Abstain? None being? The motion carries by vote of 7 0. Next, uh, we only have one more item left on the agenda tonight, and then we're going to adjourn for the evening. It's an executive session uh, to discuss legal consultation pursuant to 1 MRSA, section 4056E. So for all those tuning in from home, we will go dark after this, um, and we have nothing of consequence afterwards. So, all those in favor? Or excuse me, do I have a motion? Accept. Councilor Walker, second? Second. Councilor Gary, all those in favor? Okay, we now stand in executive session, 7-0.